Number 10. What if the leader decided to buy a hat? This is a short one, but a great one. It comes to us from one of the comedic issues of What If in the 89 series. It's just a panel featuring a What If story where the leader buys a hat. Of course, because it is a comedy issue, the leader buys the most ridiculous hat there is. Technically, two hats. Propeller hats. I just love his super serious face. This one literally made me laugh out loud. <laughs> Number 9. What if the Hulk landed on the peaceful planet that Reed Richards promised? This one is both weird, but it's also kind of great. It does a really good job of highlighting the division between Bruce Banner and the Hulk and the difference between these two entities. We're also offered a glimpse into how these two manage to work together though, and at times, teach each other and help one another. Instead of landing on Sakaar, Hulk lands on the peaceful planet that Richards had intended for him. The nature on this planet calms Hulk and soothes his soul. He and Banner, however, still have their issues and end up dividing the planet in half. Banner hunts and builds tech in an attempt to escape, but the Hulk finds happiness here and becomes worshipped as a god by a race of sort of cat-like creatures who eventually evolve to become cat people. When Banner learns of this, it's implied that he comes to terms almost with his imprisonment when at the end of the issue, we see a version of the Hulk who resembles or seems to resemble Bruce a little more than he usually would. Hulk continues to protect the cat people from, well, giant alien snakes? I don't think they were always alien snakes, but that's definitely what they evolved into. Number 8. What if the X-Men had stayed in Asgard? This is an interesting story. Here we see the X-Men split as they decide whether or not to stay in Asgard. Those that would leave are permitted to do so, but those who would stay, like Storm, Magic, Wolfsbane, Karma, Cannonball, Rogue, Nightcrawler, and Cypher, are permitted to do so, to the point that there is actually no new mutants team in Midgard any longer. Instead, we would have had a new X-Men team and basically no new mutants with those who stayed in Asgard finding a different kind of happiness there until they're forced to acknowledge that all of this was somewhat of a sham. These mutants are basically like, well we could go back but it's really terrible on earth because people are really prejudiced towards us and so we're just gonna we're just gonna chill here. This seems nicer in Asgard. Storm ends up fighting a frog version of Thor, and Magic is forced to take on Enchantress as each battles for power. In the end, Loki is defeated, as is Hela, and everyone who remains alive, which is pretty much all the mutants that chose to stay, live happily ever after in Asgard. What a nice ending. Number 7. What if Peter Parker had become Nova? In issue 15 of the 1977 What If series, it gives us a glimpse into four other options for Nova's true identity. One such option posed in these alternate storylines is Peter Parker. Here we see Peter become one of the most depressing characters when he is bitten by a radioactive spider that has absorbed a higher dose of radiation than the one on our world, or the Earth of 616. I mean, 616 isn't really our world. I don't no, do you guys think we live on 616? I think we actually have a categorization for this world. Meaning that instead of giving Peter powers, he loses the ability to control his legs, becoming paralyzed from the waist down. The shock of this accident also kills Aunt May, and Peter basically becomes the biggest sourpuss, blaming himself for everything, including the death of his aunt, and pushing everyone away from him. He refuses even to enjoy Festival Eve! Come on, Peter! Everyone enjoys Festival Eve! What is Festival Eve, though? In the end, an emerald ray grants him the powers of Nova, healing him. Amazed, he immediately heads to his uncle for advice and interrupts a burglar breaking into his Uncle Ben's home. He kills the burglar accidentally while attempting to protect his uncle and only becomes more depressed at the fact that he killed someone, refusing to be Nova, and once again blaming himself for pretty much every tragedy he has suffered or encountered in his life. This is very harsh, Peter. Like, I know Peter is normally a character who beats himself up a lot, but this is a lot even for Peter Parker. Number six, what if the Fantastic Four had different superpowers? And kind of random ones at that, although they are explained as to why they make sense. But anyways, we'll get to that in a second. One of the weirdest of these powers being Reed Richards' powers. Each of their transformations in the story just draw more inspiration from their own personality itself, which is why everything is so strange. Which means in this scenario that Reed becomes just a floating disembodied brain with telepathic abilities. He goes by the name of Big Brain and travels throughout the Baxter building or its alternate reality equivalent via a network of tubes that the FF had installed. Here Susan Storm gains powers which allow her to stretch, basically like Mr. Fantastic would have had. Johnny Storm becomes Mandroid, he's a robot, and Ben Grimm becomes Dragonfly. He's got wings. 
They look like dragon wings. The whole feel for me is more comparable to the awesome strangeness that is DC's Doom Patrol in this issue. Which I don't hate, because I like Doom Patrol. What if the Punisher was a stern yet fatherly type? <laughs> I feel like it's more gentle, but it's the Punisher, so apparently it's hardcore. This is a little one page story from What If, but I just enjoy it too much, so I had to share it with you. It shows us a very different kind of Punisher, a less grizzled and frightening Frank Castle, and much more disappointed in you guilt trip dad version of the anti hero instead. Still, people telling you that they are disappointed in you, it really sucks. So I can almost imagine this version of Frank as being actually pretty successful, especially given how fragile the egos and emotional states of most villains are. I feel like that punishment that Galactus is given in this story looks also impressively challenging given how large Galactus is and how tiny that piece of chalk is that he has to write with. It makes me think of just metal on a chalkboard which is, ah, I just got chills up my spine thinking of it. Both while I was writing this and actually just now as I was saying this. Anytime someone talks about metal or nails on a chalkboard, mmm. Sorry if I triggered anyone. What if the X-Men lost Inferno? AKA, what if Sim and the Soul Sword had simultaneously returned to their accustomed spot in Limbo? Apparently. That's like the secondary question we're given in the story. In this issue, we learn what would have happened if the X-Men lost to Madeline Pryor. In this alternate reality, Sim and Maddie end up as kind of a power couple for a time, with Wolverine as their villainous pet, whom they feed human babies to, which a feral Logan apparently devours with glee. Wow. He doesn't even seem to be able to resist their making him into a monster, which is um, strange, but yeah, I guess he's just fine with it. Rachel Summers, Phoenix, who is trapped inside a mannequin, does end up returning, giving the surviving heroes hope after the world is overrun by demons. Although also in this reality, Jean is killed by Madeline, so we don't have any Jean to save us. Wolverine kills Maddie as a reanimated skeleton after she seizes the Phoenix Force for herself, saving the world before he perishes. It's always strange when you have a skeleton wolverine just killing people. Snicked, snicked. He also manages to kill Kitty before this while he is evil. Which I'm like, Kitty, why didn't you just... Don't let yourself get hit, that's like your whole thing, but okay. This issue ends with Alicia Masters Storm, who is obviously the Human Torches paramour here, giving birth to a baby in the new world, assisted by Rachel and Doctor Strange. Yay? I love you, baby. What a weird thing to say to your babies. I just feel like it's such a strange, people, do mothers say that when their babies are born? I love you, baby. Number three, what if the Fantastic Four all had the same power as Human Torch? This is a weird and depressing story that is one of four different stories included in an issue that asks the question, what if the Fantastic Four all had the same power? The answer when it comes to the Human Torch's power is that the FF gets reckless and basically endangers human lives. In this story we see the Flamon family accidentally set a building on fire while fighting, a building that happened to have a woman's baby inside named Angel while she was working at a cafe across the street. Don't worry, she had a sitter, the baby wasn't alone or anything, but still. It's not good. The FF realizes too late that the building has caught fire, they're able to save some people, but they can't save the baby, and the story ends tragically there. So I guess them all having flame powers would not be good. We shouldn't do that in the main continuity. It'd be sad. Number two, what if Conan the Barbarian were stranded in the 20th century? If you were around for part one of this list, you'll know Conan visited modern day New York once in the What If series. This time around, we answer the question, what if he never left? Here, Conan gets into more trouble, is arrested instead of leaving, but escapes the law and ends up as a sort of unaware villain. I don't think he knows he's a villain, but he's definitely pretty villainous. He ends up working alongside criminals and returns to Danette, the cab driver he fell in love with previously, in an attempt to impress her with his new clothes and his wealth. She tells him she isn't into this new Conan, who she describes as looking like a pimp. I mean, he does have like a leopard or something on a chain. Leopard? Cheetah? What do we call that animal? What do you call an animal with spots? In the end, this path leads Conan to an epic battle with Captain America, which ends with Cap offering him a place on the Avengers, basically in a weird turn of events. <laughs> Captain America's like, I respect you. Also, you got some problems. You should join the Avengers. Conan does not accept this offer, but he does ponder it at the end of the issue, as he looks like wistfully out the window in a very tight t-shirt. I think he needs a bigger t-shirt. Number one, what if Thanos changed Galactus into a human being? 
This issue is just ridiculous good fun. This is the first story featured in the 1989 issue What If No One Was Watching the Watcher. Here we see Thanos decide to punish Galactus whom he is fighting in an even worse way than by killing him. Instead Thanos turns Galactus mortal and he appears on Earth with no recollection of who he is and coincidentally looking a lot like uh, Elvis Presley. He is found by a waitress named Gertrude who takes him in and believes herself that he is an amnesiac Elvis. She educates him on what she thinks is his history and his music and weirdly enough Galactus also has the ability to sing just like Elvis. Huh? He ends up falling in love with music and starts playing and gaining prominence as people believe he is the real king returned from the supposed dead. He even refuses to return to his life as a god when Adam Warlock finds him and reveals the truth about his history. That's just how much Galactus loves music and his new life with Gertrude and her son. I love it. Number 10. What if Doctor Doom became the thing? In this one shot we get to see an alternate reality where instead of Ben Grimm being present when the FF first transformed, Victor Von Doom was in his place instead. He found himself while in his armor transformed into the thing while the rest of the team was granted the same powers as normal. Ben Grimm ends up actually getting caught in a radioactive explosion when a reactor blows which transforms him then into the Hulk and he and Doom slash the thing battle it out. In the end Hulk Grimm is about to smash thing doom but is talked down by the rest of the FF. So like put that rock down. Calm down. It's all good, Ben. He ends up joining them while Doom still becomes the team's villain, bearing very different scars because, you know, under his mask, he's the thing. Number 9. What if Spider-Man's parents destroyed his family? This story takes an already ridiculous one and offers us another take on it. Although to be fair, I actually like this version of the story better, to be honest. Remember when Chameleon made those robots to act as Peter parents just to I don't know, reveal them as fakes and torment him? Well in this story, his fake robo parents are even worse. They end up murdering Aunt May and Mary Jane and make sure that Spider-Man is framed for the murders. In retaliation, while on the run from the law, Spider-Man pushed to his breaking point, kills Chameleon and his robo parents, getting back at them for good before turning himself into the authorities. It's a much darker take on this story. So dark. Before we move on to this next spot, just a reminder to click that like if you haven't already if you're enjoying this video. It really helps us out a ton. Number 8. What if Aunt May died instead of Uncle Ben? This one actually changed things up quite a bit, turning Peter Parker from the life of being a hero to more of a delinquent just scraping by. Everything in Peter's origins goes the same except Uncle Ben being shot. Aunt May is shot during a burglary at her home instead while she is there alone. Uncle Ben was out picking up a gallon of milk and both he and Peter are arrive home to find the police and Aunt May's corpse. It's then that Peter decides to very dramatically reveal he is Spider-Man. This part's just really ridiculous, but I love it. He goes after the burglar, ready to kill the man for taking his aunt's life. In the end, the thief falls out of a window just as Uncle Ben arrives on the scene. Rather than let Peter take the rap when the police show up or confess what truly happened, because he could just be like, that, that person just fell out a window. Uncle Ben confesses to killing the man for murdering his wife, even though he didn't. Ben goes to jail and without anyone to guide him, Peter gives up being Spider-Man. He does however don the costume once more to put JJ in his place for coming after him after the death of his son John Jameson, who in this reality wasn't rescued by Spider-Man because Spider-Man wasn't Spider-Man at the time. He also calls JJ some pretty harsh names considering the guy recently lost his son. Jeez, Spidey. Basically, if Peter Parker doesn't have Aunt May to guide him, he's kind of a jerk and is kind of terrible. So that's what I learned about that. Uncle Ben is not as good as Aunt May, apparently. Number 7. What if Green Goblin stole the Infinity Gauntlet? I personally love how this story just jumps right into it. The introduction reminds us of both the Dark Reign and Infinity events, and then they just jump right into Norman Osborn murdering his originally owned Dark Avenger Sentry with the Infinity Gauntlet. Wow. Also, how is Norman even able to wield such a powerful weapon? Because he's just like a normal human, right? Or I don't know, maybe his craziness from his Green Goblin stuff makes him possible to hold it? I don't know. 
I guess he just is, because what ifs. In this alternate universe, it's revealed that Norman Osborn takes the gauntlet and uses it to reshape the world and, by assumption, also the entire galaxy in his image, all to get back at his dad for mistreating him years earlier. In the end, Thanos shows up to claim what is his, but with the power of the gauntlet, Norman makes short work of him. Thanos also weirdly comes in, telling Norman that no amount of power will ever get him the love he seeks. Kind of a weird line for Thanos there. After the battle is won, Norman responds while standing over Thanos' charred remains, my only wish is for power, love is for fools. He then ends up killing his father from the past in a rage, and as such perishes himself because of a time paradox. Because if you kill your dad from the past, you can't exist. Although I think at that point in his life, his dad may have had him as a child, so I don't know. But that's the end. Poof, it's gone. Number six, what if Conan the Barbarian walked the earth today? Half of this what if story is just meant to reestablish Conan and explain how he gets to modern day New York. But when he does arrive, it is a pretty crazy and strange time. This apparently, according to the cover anyways, was the most requested and highly anticipated what if of the day when the first volume of what ifs was happening in the 70s. Conan, upon arriving in the modern day, has a lot of weird and, in his opinion, I'm sure disturbing experiences. One sees him harassed by an elderly woman who hits him with her bag because she believes he is too scantily clad. She's like, cover up your bottom, sir. Cover that up. Conan doesn't like this very much, and so he dumps her in a trash can. Literally, she's just stuck in it, and I'm just like, wow, Conan, that's pretty intense. She's just an old lady. He then runs into a cab driver, striking her vehicle with a sword, believing it's a monster. She ends up taking pity on him, though, saying she senses he is mostly harmless, despite the fact that he is super muscly, looks pretty angry most of the time, and just struck her cab with the freaking sword. In the end, Conan disappears from New York and is transported away when he is struck by a bolt of lightning, which does not seem to really surprise the police officers who witnessed that. I guess in modern day New York where superheroes exist, life is so fantastical that nothing really phases you. Also, maybe that's just the 70s. Like maybe in the 70s people got struck by bolts of lightning and disappeared and people were like, that's totally a normal 70s thing to happen. I don't know, I wasn't alive in the 70s, so I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> Number five, what if Vision of the Avengers conquered the world? Time to answer that burning question you always wanted answered. What if Vision of the Avengers had conquered the world? No? Did no one actually, did no one need this question answered? Well, too bad, because you're getting an answer. Vision is a supremely intelligent android, so if you're thinking this will probably end well for Earth, you're not completely wrong. Vision ruling does bring about peace and an end to poverty and hunger initially, but he also places Earth and its heroes in an intergalactic war where they are forced to take on the Skrull and the Kree. And in the end, he's also responsible for the decline of civilization somewhat when humans rebel against his rule and take out New York City in an attempt to harm Vision as his mainframe is stored there. When this fails and also eliminates millions of innocent lives as well as most of the superhero community, the humans turn on technology technology and evolve into further anarchy and chaos. Yikes. So basically, we shouldn't let Vision rule the Earth. That's the moral of the story. It's not going to end well, probably. Number four, what if Prince Namor of Atlantis grew up on land? I feel like a lot of the other heroes and teams that were highlighted in this early 2000s batch of what ifs got much more interesting concepts thrown their way. The answer to this what if is likely just what you imagine. Namor is kind of just less impressive. It starts off after Namor gets teased for being unable to swim. A Namor that can't swim. Hmm. Yeah. Although I do feel bad for him getting teased, but still, I was like, wow, this is the reality we're in. He still ends up fighting alongside the allies and heroes of World War II, but without the power of Atlantis at his back as he turns away from his heritage, instead choosing to ally himself with the land dwellers instead of oppose them. In the end, however, when he's ordered to blow up his people because of their proximity to the enemy, he refuses and does end up returning to Atlantis, but too late as his people still end up getting blown up in the crossfire. Like most what ifs, Namor is left returning to the man we know him to be, the avenging son of his people and of the sea. It's like swimming and he's like, I can swim now and also I'm gonna avenge these people that died. 
Not Atlantis, no. Number three, what if Captain America were revived today? This story is both weird and amazing. Also, I believe there are two versions of it, so to clarify, the one we're talking about here is from the 77 What If series, issue number 44. This story imagines what if we got the fake Cap before we got the real Cap. If you don't know that story, it comes from a retcon where Marvel chose to explain away the fact that Cap was supposedly around during the time we later said he was frozen. The retcon goes that the Cap and Bucky we saw after the original pair's disappearance at the end of World War II were actually fakes, who were driven mad from exposure to the super soldier serum, which obviously didn't work as well as it had with the original Cap. The fake Cap being revived first revealed just how intense he was when he started going after people he deemed communists and insisting that certain Americans, such as the youth and minorities, were far too divided and should be more patriotic. Fortunately, we come to the present day where the real Captain America is revived, he takes on the imposter and we get a pretty sweet cap on cap fight where the real Captain America actually tells the imposter that the USA only needs him as a reminder of basically how not to be. He goes on to speak to the people after defeating the crazed imposter that he told you that Americans were the greatest people, that America could be refined like silver, could have the impurities hammered out of it and shine more brightly. He went on about how precious America was, how you needed to make sure it remained great, and he told you anything was justified to preserve that great treasure, that pearl of great price that is America. Well, I say America is nothing without its ideals, its commitment to the freedom of all men. America is a piece of trash. He goes on to remind people it's not the flag they should fight for, but the freedom that makes this nation and its people great, and reminds people that they need to work to protect those freedoms for all Americans, not sacrifice them for the promise of greatness. It's also just like, it's a weird issue and it's a great issue. That speech at the end is like, it's beautiful. You should all read it. It's pretty great. Number two, what if Betty Brandt was bitten by the radioactive spider instead? This is the second tale in the what if someone else besides Spider-Man had been bitten by the radioactive spider issue. You might know about Flash and John Jameson, but do you remember Betty's story from this one, wedged in between the stories belonging to those two gents? It is actually super ridiculous. Betty faints when she is bitten because she actually can't stand spiders and they make her queasy. Her power is surfaced while she's off to coffee with Peter and smashes the table in a rage while talking about her infuriating boss, JJ. It also features one of the most ridiculous Spider Woman costumes I have ever seen. It's so ridiculous, oh my goodness. Number one, what if the original Marvel bullpen had become the Fantastic Four? Yep, this what if story is pretty crazy and it imagines what the Fantastic Four might be like if some of the original Marvel staff were transformed by cosmic radio waves into the FF themselves. It features Stan Lee as Mr. Fantastic, Sol Brodsky as the Human Torch, appropriate considering his first name, Jack Kirby with almost pinkish or purple hued hair in this issue as the Thing, and finally fabulous Flo Steinberg as the Invisible Woman. It all happens after the team receives a gift from a mysteriously glossy eyed fan. It turns out the gift is some kind of contraption that the team thinks is a radio, but then it seems to blast them with a bunch of super power granting cosmic rays, or their radio equivalent. The story sees the Marvel staff F crossing paths with Namor and even taking on Skrulls. Number 10, what if Aunt May was a mutant with claws? I just love how this is posed as a scenario where Aunt May just uses her claws in place of the good old fashioned parental guilt trip. Aunt May is having dinner with her nephew Peter and his girlfriend Mary Jane. She cooked for them and they immensely enjoyed their meal, but when she offers them a pie for dessert, they both insist they're just too full and they cannot eat another bite. They offer that after their date, they're going to see a show, they might have a slice upon their return. But this isn't good enough for Aunt May. Fortunately, in this story, she has Wolverine claws which she snicks out and uses to intimidate the youngsters into postponing their date so they can stay for dessert. She uses her claws of course to also slice the pie because Aunt May. <laughs> What else is she gonna use them for? Although I would really love an alternate world where Aunt May just was Wolverine. Or I was posing earlier an idea of an alternate world where everyone is Aunt May. What about that world? Number nine, 
what if Iron Man demon in an armor? Remember that time Tony Stark and Victor Von Doom swapped bodies? Oh yeah, that's the thing that happened in this what if special out of 2010. Here both brilliant minds were roommates in college and Victor used a machine on Stark to swap minds with him. Stark's memories were also wiped so he never knew he had been Tony Stark. Victor as Tony used his millions to create his own inventions but ultimately ended up ruining the Stark name with less than noble pursuits and his own greed. On the other hand, Stark as Victor succumbed to alcoholism but recovered and then created Doom Industries, a brilliant company responsible for its own Doom armor suits and technological advancements. In the end, Doom and Stark's body attempted to attack Doom Industries but was apprehended by Stark in Doom's body. He then revealed the swap that had taken place years earlier and bargained to swap back in exchange for his freedom, but Stark in Doom's body is just like, nah thanks, I kinda have the better company and life now in your body. I like this body. Why, why would I want to be Tony now when I can just be the honorable Dr. Doom? Good point. Good point. Why would you ever want to be Tony Stark when you could be Dr. Doom? That's the real question. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Number eight. What if Sergeant Fury had fought World War II in outer space? This story offers a glimpse into an alternate reality where World War II was fought in space? This story takes place in an alternate reality where instead of being divided by eastern and western fronts, the battle is divided between beta and alpha sectors. As such, we get to see Sergeant Nick Fury fighting alongside the Howling Commandos in outer space, smoking a cigar even while wearing his space helmet. Seems like a bad idea, but it's Nick Fury so that's what he's gonna do. It's also explained that we have Da Vinci's inventions to thank for this early technological advancement which led to us getting to outer space in the 1940s. Which is maybe the best bit of exposition explanation in the book. And just in general that I've read. It's pretty ridiculous. Oh, and of course we also get to watch our heroes fight aliens because space. Number seven, what if the world knew Daredevil was blind? Yeah, this is a weird story. Especially because it kind of implies that if Daredevil wasn't blind and didn't have superpowers, his life would actually be better or easier. As though like, you know, if you're blind, your life is going to be terrible, but if you're not blind, your life is great. Which I don't think is true. That's not how that works. I mean, he's also still got an enemy in Wilson Fisk, I'd assume, so I just feel like this is a big oversimplification. In this story, the world finds out that Daredevil is blind, and as a result, those close to him begin to piece together that Daredevil is, in fact, Matt Murdock. Because, you know, Matt Murdock is blind. Get it? He then ends up having his sight restored via an operation, unmasks, and lives happily ever after with Karen, trading his heroic initials of DD for DA and becoming the new district attorney of New York. He's swapping it out. I also love how Karen's like, oh, thank goodness you're not a superhero. Now we can get married. Number six, what if Black Bolt talked in his sleep? This is a very short story, and I think you can imagine how it ends. If you are familiar with the Inhuman King, known as Black Bolt, but it's also just very humorously written. You can find this single page story near the back of issue 9 of What If Volume Number 2. Apparently when Black Bolt eats pineapple pizza before bed, it has disastrous consequences. Also good to know what kind of pizza Black Bolt likes. I personally also love pineapple on my pizza, but I feel like that just lets you know if someone's cool or not. Oh, the strange things that you learn <laughs> about people and pizza. If Black Bolt talked in his sleep all the time, the Inhumans would have a lot of rebuilding to do all the time. I also just like how resigned some of these Inhumans are in that last panel. Like, oh, he did it again. I guess I'm just gonna sleep on some rubble for the rest of the night. That's just how it is. Shucks. And only Medusa is the one that's mad. She's like, baby, I told you not to eat that pizza. This always happens. Number five, what if Wolverine had a styrofoam skeleton? Issue 100 is just one of the best for some real weird stories. One of the stories it offers us is only told through a mock-up cover, but it's so good, it's just gotta be mentioned because the cover is just too good. It also also is presented beside another great mock-up cover offering an alternate story where Peter Parker became Sheep Boy instead of Spider-Man. Ah, uh, Sheep Boy. I love it. In the Wolverine mock-up, we're offered an alternate Logan who goes by the code name Wolverwim. He is cowering on the front cover, about to have his styrofoam skeleton ripped out by Maggie Nito, a mean little girl. I 
also just love the reference to Wolverine also losing his nose when he lost his adamantium that's on there. Mock up what if stories are actually the best. I wish we got a full story of this. Someone write that, please. Number four, what if Iron Man was trapped in the time of King Arthur? The craziest thing about this what if is that it's actually kind of an alternate retelling of a real life main continuity story where Iron Man was transported to Camelot in medieval times with Doctor Doom and managed to escape. Although this story offers the alternative of, you know, what if he wasn't able to escape and only Doctor Doom got out? You can find it in What If Volume 1, Issue 33. The answer to the question is that Iron Man would be drained of energy, get frustrated in realizing that, you know, he couldn't rebuild a time machine, and ends up becoming Sir Anthony of Iron, an Iron Knight at King Arthur's Round Table. In fact, he uses his suit to help protect the realm from the evil Morgana, defeating her, but in the ensuing battle is unable to prevent King Arthur from becoming mortally wounded. With his dying breath, Arthur makes Sir Anthony his successor. Even though they kind of just met, but it's fine I guess. Which means that the Anthony of Iron Man's past, his past self from the future, would probably be really weirded out if he ever read any stories of Camelot. He'd be like, ah, Sir Anthony of Iron became the king. Wait. I'm Iron Man. What? Maybe that was actually his inspiration in the alternate reality to create the Iron Man suit. And now Tony's just stuck in like a time loop. Number three, what if Wolverine was the Lord of Vampires? In this story, Wolverine becomes the new Lord of Vampires, which is kind of weird considering what we know of Wolverine's healing factor now, but this is also obviously an alternate reality and a story that was written in the 90s, so there's that. Here Wolverine is transformed into a vampire by Dracula. It also features a sweet vampire hunter version of Punisher who is sporting Doctor Strange's cape, and I personally think that the Punisher looks amazing in that cape. So lavish. I just want him to wear capes all the time now. In the end, Punisher is defeated, but Wolverine has a crisis of conscience and ends up flipping to the side of good once more, killing himself and all the other vampire soups and villains he made at the same time. And for some reason, Doc Ock's body and tentacles turn to dust? Now, shouldn't his tentacles be okay though? Because they're not like, they're not made of his tissue. Also, I love when people are like, you're dust, and all their clothes become dust. I'm like, shouldn't their clothes be fine? Anyways, it's a small technical thing, but it bothers me. Number two, what if paper skin? Remember when we were talking about issue 100 of volume two of what if? Well, an actual story that is featured in there is called paper skin. It is honestly such a strange story. I need to share it with you. This is a what if story that seems to posit the question of what if Mr. Sinister could offer you Gambit a cure for Rogue's powers. It's revealed in the story that Gambit has already betrayed the X-Men by bargaining with Sinister, offering important Cerebro files in exchange for what he wants. Although what Gambit wants is not actually for him, but is kind of for all mutant kind, a cure to the legacy virus. As he's about to leave after getting that cure, Sinister offers him something else that he simply can't resist. A cure for Rogue, his one true love, to help her control her powers. He agrees to steal one more thing for Sinister in exchange for the cure. A type Box. Sinister has been searching for them and collecting them over the years. In the end, Rogue accepts the cure, but can't accept that Gambit has been helping Sinister, and so she kills him, taking his powers and also his looks, seemingly. Which is kind of weird. It's like Gambit with b and I'm like, I don't know how I feel about this art, but okay. She goes after Sinister only to find the secret of what the boxes contained was Marvel Comics! Gasp. Ah, oh, now Sinister has so much information because he's been reading Marvel Comics. What a weird reality. What a meta reality. Number one, what if Avengers vs. X-Men? In this bizarro story, Magneto helps to ensure that Hope ends up getting the Phoenix Force instead of it being split up into Iron Man by five parts, which possesses and creates the Phoenix Five. Magneto is seemingly helping Hope to control these new and awesome powers, but when she struggles and begins to turn dark, he suggests she give him some power to help her. In reality, Magneto kind of wants all the power for himself, which is just what he takes. This all happens in the the last issue, by the way, of this four part what if story. And after Magneto takes the power, it gets pretty weird. Yeah, that's not where it ends. It just keeps going forever. He takes the power and is instantly corrupted by it. As such, Xavier somehow uses his powers to temporarily mess with Magneto's sight, despite the fact that Magneto was wearing his helmet. And then Wolverine snicks him through the eyes. This results in Magneto basically exploding, killing everyone on the planet, and destroying the Earth. Then Jean shows up randomly and just kind of reveals she saw all of this coming. She uses her phoenix powers to fix the planet, bringing back plant and animal life, but not people for some reason. She says it's up to her and Wolverine as basically an Eve and an Adam of sorts to do that. She could have just brought all those people back, I'm pretty sure, because she's got the, the power of the phoenix, but yeah, it's a weird one. 
It's a weird one. Number 10. What if Captain America hadn't vanished during World War II? Captain America did vanish during World War II in the main continuity, but there is another important plot point in this story that we've seen happen more than once in comics, and that is Bucky Barnes taking over as Captain America. While Bucky was believed dead for years in the comics, he eventually returned in the early 2000s as the Winter Soldier, and it was revealed while being suspected as deceased after falling from a plane and being reported MIA that he had actually survived all these years. We've seen him take over and become Captain America both during the House of M event and in the main continuity during Brubaker's run of Captain America in 2008. And he also died as Captain America in the main continuity as well. So that's pretty interesting. Or we thought he died. <laughs> Who knows if that would have been the truth in the what if story if it had continued. Number 9. What if Iron Man had been a traitor? It might have not gone down the same way as it did in the what if, but a version of this story did end up becoming true in the bizarre crossing event in the mid 90s. Here it was revealed that Iron Man was actually a traitor, though this time around a less innocent one. It was revealed he had been made Kang's sleeper agent and was working in league with the villain. In the end, traitorous Tony Stark died and a younger version of himself still good since he had been taken from a point in his timeline before Iron Man had been influenced by Kang, took his place. In the What If special, he instead becomes a traitor working for China against his nation and his fellow teammates and friends. Fortunately, Iron Man is rescued from being used as a pawn by Mr. Fantastic of the Fantastic Four, who received his message requesting help. So he wasn't as traitorous in that story as he was in the main continuity. Number 8. What If This Was The Fantastic Four This was a story told as part of the Hero Initiative. Mike Waringo had been working on the What If story before he suddenly passed away and had completed 7 pages of it. As such, the release date for the story was pushed back and it was utilized as a tribute for the amazing artist. The story is kind of an interesting special case where the What If was actually inspired by a true story that came before it from the main continuity, between issues 347 to 349 of the Fantastic Four series. The alternate team comprised of the Hulk as Joe Fixit, Spider-Man, Wolverine, and Danny Ketch as Ghost Rider stepped in to replace the Fantastic Four after they were tricked into believing most of the original team had actually perished by a Skrull who was posing as the Invisible Woman. I think it was Delilah. I think that's how we still say her name. It's like D apostrophe. Delilah? Yeah, I think so. This team was brought back a few more times in the comics and eventually became known as the go to FF substitute team and team members, and are still referred to as such in comics today. This 2008 What If series imagined an alternate retelling where the team simply remained as the only FF left after the Skrull who had tricked them killed the original team members instead of simply incapacitating them. Waringo was also misinformed during the creation of the What If and instead drew Johnny Blaze as Ghost Rider instead of Danny Ketch as Ghost Rider. Although this was going to be corrected before the book was published, because of his passing, Marvel decided to leave the art as it was, as opposed to altering Mike's art after his passing. Which I kind of agree with that decision, because I feel like that would have been really distasteful to his memory to change it. So instead we get Johnny Blaze. But other than that, this is a crew that's already happened in the comics. Number 7. What if Punisher's family hadn't been killed? Though of course in this story, the Punisher's family is still killed, because yeah, it's kind of hard for Frank Castle to even become any version of the Punisher otherwise. However, instead of him being inspired to take up arms after his family gets caught in the crossfire of a mob hit and killed, they survive that fateful day, all because it rained on their picnic. Whew, that's some lucky rain. Frank becomes inspired to join the force and become a police officer. However, when offered a bribe, he reports the incident to his captain, hoping to book the crooks who are paying off the cops to look the other way. In the end, it's revealed that even his captain is part of this scheme, and he and his family are still targeted, but this time by some dirty cops. He survives, however, and becomes the Punisher. While this story does not make its way into the main continuity of Earth 616, this was basically verbatim the backstory used for the ultimate Punisher from the kind of main continuity adjacent Earth of 1610. After all, there was a time when Ultimate was so big it was like basically an alternate main continuity. Number 6. What if Jessica Jones had joined the Avengers? Not surprisingly, this story was written by Brian Michael Bendis. In the What If, we get to see a hypothetical world where Jessica Jones is offered a spot on the Avengers shortly after she attacked them after being mind controlled by the purple man, Kilgrave. Here she joins the team and ends up marrying Captain America. In reality, aka the main continuity, Jessica Jones would end up joining the new Avengers alongside her husband on 
showrunner 616, Luke Cage, six years later in terms of the comic's release date, joining up with the team in 2010's New Avengers run in issue number one. Can you guess who the writer was for that issue? Yep, Brian Michael Bendis. Brian Michael Bendis' New Avengers. I like that though. I like Jessica Jones on The Avengers. I think that's cool. Number five, what if General Ross had become the Hulk? This story came out only a few years before General Ross became the villain and beast known as Red Hulk. Although this story isn't quite as close to the original as our previous point. The what if story was written by Peter Davis while the issue where Ross takes up the mantle of Red Hulk happens in an issue of Hulk written by Jeff Loeb. So we've got two different writers for this one as opposed to them both being the same person. And a dark twist, General Ross in the what if issue ends up becoming the Hulk in the place of Bruce Banner. He becomes a rage fueled monster who has to be put down by Bruce himself after he kills his own daughter Betty by accident when he tosses a tank which lands crushing her. Devastating. Number 4. What if Spider Man joined the Fantastic Four? This one takes a different direction but arrives at the same goal. In the What If story, Spider Man, instead of being turned away by the FF on their first meeting with him when he attempts to join up, offers to hear him out. Sue convinces her team to listen to Spider Man and they eventually decide that he can join their team, becoming the Fantastic Five instead of the Fantastic Four. They all fives on their chest. In the end, Sue ends up leaving the team with Spider Man feeling that him showing her up was what caused her to leave. Wow, big ego much Spider-Man? She ends up choosing to leave the FF and be with Namor and he transforms her into an Atlantean intending for Sue to become his queen. In the main continuity, Spider-Man joins the new version of the FF at the time known as the Future Foundation instead after the other Storm sibling has left. Johnny Storm was thought to be dead at that time and so Spider-Man basically fills in his spot on the Fantastic Four team. To this day, Spider-Man is still considered to be on the extended roster to fill in as a substitute member when needed. Number 3. What if the Hulk had the brain of Bruce Banner? Well, this one might not line up exactly either. You'll definitely see similarities when it comes to the premise. In this story, we get to see what would happen if the Hulk ended up being as level headed and intelligent as Bruce Banner. Sound familiar? Later on in 1991, we get our first look at a version of the Hulk that was Bruce Banner, the Grey Hulk persona, and the Green Hulk persona merged, leading us down a road to what we'd later come to know as Professor Hulk. Of course, in the what if, we also saw a new being named X Man come into being when Mr. Fantastic, Professor X, and Intelligent Hulk merged in an attempt to defeat Galactus. And I don't think we've seen that part come true just yet. Number two, what if Jay? Jane Foster had found the Hammer of Thor. In this issue, we see what would happen if Jane Foster were the one to find and retrieve Thor's hammer, being deemed worthy by the weapon to wield it. She takes up the name Thordis in this issue and ends up fighting Loki. Upon meeting Odin, even in her Thordis form, he still does not like Jane, seeing her as an imposter, a Valkyrie in Thor's raiment. In the end, Odin gets over his distaste of Thordis and Jane Foster after she helps him to avert Ragnarok. Rock. He does make her give the hammer back to Thor who is currently Donald Blake, but as a reward he also makes her an Asgardian goddess. Not a bad trade. In the main continuity, Jane became Lady Thor after Thor was deemed not worthy and the hammer called to her. Number 1. What if Thor was the Herald of Galactus? This one recently came true in Donny Cates' current run on Thor. Thor and Galactus teamed up initially to take on the universal threat that was the Black Winter. However, this idea was initially explored by Robert Kirkman more than 10 years earlier in the 2005 What If Thor. In this What If story, Thor becomes the Herald of Galactus and instead teams up with him to take on Loki, who has conquered Asgard and killed Odin after initially agreeing to become Galactus' Herald to save Asgard from his hunger. Thor instead decides to let Galactus devour Asgard now that it is in ruins and Loki rules it, first allowing his friends and fellow Asgardians who survived Loki's initial assault to escape to Midgard. Then he murders a bunch of frost giants and lets Galactus have his fill. Number 10. What if the Avengers battled the Carnage Cosmic? Carnage Cosmic is a version of Carnage where he is bonded to none other than the Silver Surfer. During the first appearance of this hypothetical monstrosity, Carnage simply used Silver Surfer as a mode of transportation to get back to his beloved host, Cletus Cassidy. However, in issue 108 of What If Volume 2 in the 1989 series, we examine what would happen if the villain became more of a greater threat. It takes all of the Avengers to even stand a 
chance against him, and even then they are overwhelmed. In the end, Silver Surfer is forced to fly into the sun to get rid of the stubborn and deadly symbiote, which also means he has to fight for control all the while. Number 9. What if Rick Jones became the Hulk? Okay, so admittedly this story is more silly than scary, but if you actually think through everything Rick Jones goes through here and the fate of Hulk at the end of the story, it can be seen as, well, being pretty scary. Also, I just really like it. Like Annihilus' voice and demeanor, it's both a scary and raunchy story. Yeah, you heard me right, raunchy. Don't ask me, Rick is the one that mentions Annihilus' raunchiness in this issue. Here we see Rick not only become the big green Goliath, but we also watch as he finds himself bonded with Captain Marvel as well, sharing a body with him. So, just a lot going on all at once in my opinion. You'd think we'd swap his Marvel Negaband story for the Hulk one, but no, we're not going to do that. In this reality, both happen. In the end, Mr. Fantastic and normal Bruce Banner end up helping Rick return to normal, but Hulk remains trapped in the Nega Zone with Annihilus, so they kind of get like separated. He makes quick work of the villain while in the Nega Zone, then remains stuck there for forever? He doesn't seem to mind at the end of the story, but I feel like if we checked back on him in a few months, he wouldn't be quite as happy. Seems like a strangely happy spin on what should be a pretty dark ending. I also just like how everyone after is like, it turned out great for everyone, or for most of us. What house Hulk? <laughs> and Rick's just like, I'm sure he's fine cut to Hulk having the best time. And before we move on to our number eight spot, just a quick reminder, if you're enjoying this list and lists like this, be sure to give this video a thumbs up. It really does help us out here at the channel. Number eight, what if John Jameson had become the amazing Spider-Man? This one is more sad than it is scary, but it has a pretty tragic ending, so I still felt it was appropriate enough to include it here. In the final story included in this What If issue, we learn of an alternate reality where John Jameson ends up becoming Spider-Man, or Spider-Jameson. <laughs> Instead of being reviled by J. Jonah Jameson, his father, he is completely supported by J.J. Because, yeah, that's his son, and Jameson Sr. knows that he's, you know, Spider-Man. Jameson even designs John's spider suit here. However, in the end, John dies while attempting to help with the same mission that 616 Peter Parker Spider-Man ended up saving him from, leaving his father heartbroken. What a tragic ending. Died the same way he died sort of in 616, but different circumstances? Mm. Number seven, what if the Avengers had never been? This issue ends pretty darkly in a reality where we explore the future of the Avengers who did not stay banded together after Hulk left. Instead of going to search for Hulk together, Thor has the revelation that Hulk should be allowed to leave if he would like, as, you know, none of the Avengers have taken an oath to remain loyal forever or any such thing. Iron Man then calls Thor out for only thinking this way because he too is planning on leaving. Stark obviously has some, like, abandonment issues, I feel like. Thor doesn't take kindly to this retort and does leave, and so do Hank and Janet, currently known here as Giant Man and the Wasp. In the end, Hulk teams up with Namor and Iron Man is forced to face them solo styles after trying a few times to get the team back together. Eventually, Giant Man and the Wasp do end up showing up to help Iron Man out, but sadly, it ends up being too late. During the fray, Iron Man is badly injured, and while the heroes win the day in the end, their victory comes at the cost of Iron Man's life. How tragic. How dark. Death. Number six, Public Enemy number one. This story comes at us from the line of what is stories we got in 2006. It tells the tale of James Howlett, Logan, Wolverine, who ends up teaming up with Matteo Di Pergio in Chicago to defeat criminal and mob boss Scarface. Here, Logan becomes a version of, I guess, the Skull, the man responsible for killing Scarface, but he also becomes something else. He wears a flag on his chest that shows the Jolly Roger and this skull and crossbow phone symbol as well as the backstory of his family who were burnt to a crisp are meant to also make him another feared vigilante character well known in the Marvel Universe as the Punisher. And when I say his family was burnt to a crisp I mean like 
killed burnt to a crisp, not like they got a bad sunburn, just so you know. This is a dark and gritty tale that also gives us a pretty awesome historical atmosphere, as well as an overall gangster story tone that's quite dark and draws you in. It's both scary and intriguing, which is how I like anything that's scary personally. I'm like, ah, this is scary, but it makes me think, which I like. Number five, what if Prince Namor of Atlantis grew up on land? This story's title doesn't inherently make it sound scary, and yet. Namor here, instead of siding with his own people of Atlantis and that heritage, decides to align himself with land dwellers, turning his back on the sea. He still fought in World War II, but during that time lost his friend, the android known as the Human Torch, or Jim Hammond. So, not Johnny Storm, different Human Torch. Immortalized as a hero, the Human Torch's memory lives on. But so too, does it seem, did he. 30 years later, the government gets a signal, which they think is from the Human Torch, calling out, repeating the same word he was saying on repeat when he went missing, Namor. Namor is sent in to investigate and finds his people have been enslaved by a race of half-human and half-Atlantean people, who it turns out are still allied with Germany and the Axis, despite the war being long over. They plan on using the Human Torch under the sea to create a huge and damaging explosion. Namor prevents their plans, but is then ordered to destroy Atlantis, despite the fact that those enslaved are trying to fight back. In the end, he refuses to harm his own people, but the government doesn't care and they blow them up anyways, leaving Namor to once again live up to the meaning of his name, Avenging Sun. They also thought they killed Namor, but <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> Namor is not that easy to kill. Number four, what if the Marvel superheroes had lost Atlantis attacks? Yes, what if? Atlantis Attacks is such a weird story. Well, the world would basically be ruled by snake people is the answer, and yeah, that's what happens here. Here, Set is not prevented from arriving and being released upon the world. Once the Elder God does arrive, he sets to work raising the planet and turning everyone into his snake people, including some of our favorite heroes. In the end, only a handful of heroes and villains are left to set everything right, and even they fail. Quasar does manage in the end to defeat Set, but the world is still left covered in giant snakes and snake people with no foreseeable way to fix it. And many of our favorite heroes and villains are left either transformed into snake people or dead. Pretty scary. Number three, what if the Avengers had become the pawns of Korvac? In this reality, we examine what would happen had Korvac been successful in defeating Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers, and succeeded in standing up against all who opposed him because of the constant love of a woman. You can do anything if you have the love of a good person, apparently. In the end, Michael Korvac brings some of the heroes back to life to serve him as he goes up against even mightier enemies. Armed with the ultimate nullifier at the end, however, Korvac uses it to bring ultimate order to all things, which actually results in everything being destroyed in that reality, including the entire reality itself. So I guess bringing order means killing everything? I guess you can't have disorder if there's nothing. Number two, Kingdom of Cain. This what if story comes to us from issue 94 of volume two, the 1989 what if series. Here we see the Juggernaut roams the post-apocalyptic landscape of the Earth completely alone. The sole survivor after a disastrous sentinel attack which decimated the Earth's heroes and the Earth itself by leaking radiation poisoning all over the place. Juggernaut seems to be the only one capable of living in this place and he becomes almost driven mad by the loneliness he's the only one. Until he discovers that not everyone is dead, but actually some people have survived and are living in safety in an underground bunker. This discovery comes after he runs into Magneto, who tells Juggernaut that he knows for certain, having peered into alternate timelines, that this is all his fault, and that everyone that was killed all happened because he himself killed Charles Xavier, his stepbrother. When Cain finds the rest of the mutants who have survived, he hastily breaks through into their bunker, thereby exposing them to the radiation poisoning on the Earth's surface and ultimately kills them too, albeit by accident, which, yeah, is really sad. He's like, I don't want to be mean, I just want to talk to someone, and they're like, we're dying now because of you. Get out of here. No one wants to talk to you, Kane. Number one, what if the Fantastic Four's second child had lived? This doesn't sound like it should be the scariest story on the list, 
but it definitely is. The first story in this series is just a straight-up horror story where Sue ends up giving birth to a healthy baby girl, but dying herself in childbirth. And that's not even the scary part. From the beginning, the doctors warned her that her pregnancy would be difficult, and from the beginning, Franklin Richards knew something was wrong with his unborn sister. Is like the most dark, menacing face. When the baby does come into the world, who's named after her deceased mother, so I guess like Sue Jr., it's revealed that she is actually an energy-draining monster who kills those around her by feeding on their life force energy. Franklin is finally able to convince his father of this, but too late, as Reed dies in the ensuing battle, leaving Franklin all alone. Just a sad orphan. Also, yeah, he was so right. His sister's like a straight up demon monster thing. Yikes. Number 10. What if Mary Jane had been shot instead of Aunt May? This is a really epic and dark story where Peter ends up going on a rampage when Mary Jane is killed by Kingpin's hired sniper assassin instead of Aunt May. Peter manages to save Aunt May, but Mary Jane ends up dead, and as a result, Pete dons his black suit and goes after the Kingpin himself. He is met with resistance when Tony Stark as Iron Man attempts to confront him and talk sense into him. Spider Man, however, is too far gone and is definitely not in the mood for advice from Tony Stark. This results in an epic fight between the two heroes, while Wilson Fisk's life hangs in the balance of who will win. In the end, Peter ends up getting his revenge, one punching Fisk to death before being arrested by the authorities. He regrets ever trusting Tony Stark and ever marrying Mary Jane. As Wilson Fisk would say, this issue is so goth. Number 9. What if Spider-Man became the Punisher? This one ends up at least having a happy ending, but starts off being pretty dark and pretty scary. In this story, we imagine what life would have been like for Peter if he had become the Punisher. Instead of beating his villains and them ending up just locked away, for many, their fate is much more final. Even the Green Goblin ends up being killed by Spider-Man Punisher following the confrontation with Gwen at the bridge. Gwen, however, lives, not killed from the great height from which she was dropped. I do love how they keep drilling in that it would be the fall, not the impact, that would kill her, like in the original story, which I always thought was so bizarre. Spider-Man Punisher saves Gwen, but Green Goblin ends up dead, and Harry swears vengeance on the man who killed his father. Although this story has a dark and murderous narrative, it gives us a more happy ending, sort of. Peter chooses love instead of vengeance in the end and gives up being the Punisher, retiring from vigilante life to go be happy with Gwen. As this decision is made, however, Frank Castle loses his family and miraculously survives the shootout in Central Park, in the end becoming the Punisher in this reality as was fated. Although I do think it's really weird in that story that like Gwen living is the thing that like changes that for him. If your like girlfriend's life was threatened, wouldn't that make you more angry? Maybe not. I've never been Spider-Man, so I don't really know. All right, friends, before we move on to this next spot, just a quick reminder to click that thumbs up. It's good for your health, it's good for your heart, it's good for your brain. Number eight, what if Ord resurrected Jean Grey instead of Colossus? In this story, Jean is brought back to life at a time where it is revealed that Cassandra Nova holds influence over Emma Frost. Fearing the return of the Phoenix Force, which would join to Jean Grey once more, Emma decides to take matters into her own hands. Her own diamond hands. It's revealed that the Phoenix Force has been lurking within her cuckoo's minds, and she decides to take hold of it, killing them in the process. Tragic. She then plans on defeating Jean. The X-Men band together to face her, and S.H.I.E.L.D. and S.W.O.R.D. also conveniently join the fray. It's like, we're here too. In the end, Ord, Beast, Emma, and her cuckoos, and Kitty lay dead, and the Phoenix is contained, but Cassandra remains undetected, still out there waiting for the right moment to strike. Number seven. What If, The Spider Who Went Into the Cold. This story comes to us from the What If story Spider-Man vs Wolverine, and asks the question, what if Spider-Man never came back out from the cold? This story sees Peter Parker actually kill someone while acting as Spider-Man. It was an accident. He thought the person had armor that would protect him from the hit, but it was powered down. Of course, who should be working alongside Spidey when this happens, but of course Wolverine, who shows no remorse for what Spider-Man has done, jokingly suggesting that they cry about it. In the end, this event changes Peter after he and Wolverine save his friend Alex, and this causes him to become a killing machine. He receives further training, and although he still has a sense of morality, no longer has qualms with taking out the bad guys permanently. He leaves MJ and his life behind, setting out to join S.H.I.E.L.D., working on as a hired Black Ops team. I also want to love a good Spider-Man Wolverine team up, because it's just not 
what you usually get. I love when they team up. Number six, what if Iron Man had been a traitor? I personally think this one is pretty scary if you put yourself in Iron Man shoes. For me, one of my biggest fears, and I think one of the most human fears out there, is just a lack of control. In Tony Stark's case, he doesn't really have any control over what he does or how he acts in this story, but is forced into being a traitor when a rival country gains control of his heart. If he refuses to do as is demanded of him, he is put through intense and unyielding chest pains and could be killed. This ends up putting him on a path to attempt to kill Reed Richards, all while leaving a trail of breadcrumbs for Reed to follow so that he might be able to figure out that Stark's actions are not his true intentions and that he is being manipulated into harming his compatriots and betraying his country. Number five, what if the man, the monster? This is actually one of the scariest ones for me in my opinion. This story was such an intense story that we didn't even get an introduction from the watcher Yuata. Here we have a story where the roles are reversed between Bruce and the Hulk, where Bruce is the monster and the Hulk, or Starman as he's known here, is the sensitive, compassionate one. Here Bruce Banner is a colonel who marries Betty only to mistreat her after being traumatized from years of being mistreated by his own father and witnessing the cruelty his father doled out to his mother. The gamma radiation does split Banner into two beings here, transforming him into another creature with immense power, but this creature is the side of him that actually represents the compassionate side of this trauma. The side who wants to protect, not hurt. Whereas Bruce Banner himself becomes the malicious monster. We hear this story from Betty's perspective, who ends up trying to speak out on the way Bruce has treated her, only to have her father not even believe her and send her back to Bruce once she's left, and to later have her confession to Doc Samson manipulated by a Colonel Banner, causing her to end up getting sent to a mental institution. Also, I'm not sure what's happening in this last panel of this comic, if it's just like she doesn't know that they're about to come get her and take her away, or if she's there and she's just like, I'm at, it's fine that I'm here. I'm gonna assume it's the first one, because otherwise that's a really weird way to end that story. Number four, what if Legion had killed Xavier and Magneto? Just imagine how messed up Age of Apocalypse would be, but also you don't have to because the story's gonna do it for you. Thank you, what if. As always, when things get this bad, we have Nate to save the day. Nate Summers believes he can band together his own team of the few heroes left alive after Apocalypse's unopposed rise to take down Apocalypse and even travel back to the past to make things right. Silly Nate Summers. Instead, this only results in Captain America and Wolverine. Wolverine's hair here, by the way, is the real horror show of this story, opposing Nate's plan once it is revealed. Seeing Nate in Apocalypse's armor after Nate has defeated Apocalypse causes them to believe that Nate is trying to kind of take the place of Apocalypse and in essence become a new kind of tyrant, but a tyrant all the same. As Nate uses the Eye of Egamoto and Molecule Man to travel back in time to what he doesn't know is an alternate reality's past, Captain America, armed with Thor's hammer, sends a bolt of lightning after him that kills thousands in that past, setting in motion the apocalypse once more. Ah. Number three, what if danger became a bride of Ultron? I like how the title is a bride, even though in this reality danger becomes like the ultimate bride of Ultron. A bride, as though in this reality, Ultron is like multiple brides. I feel like that never works out for him, to be honest. But either way, this gives Ultron what he has always truly desired. That sweet, sweet love connection. I mean, completion, yes. Completion. That's what he's looking for. After Danger rebels against the X Men seeking revenge, basically for years of being used and trapped as their danger room, with no one acknowledging her sentience, Ultron hears her calling out, senses her, and leaves his creation, Victor, destroying him in order to find her. The two come together, and as a wedding present, Ultron gives Danger her father, Professor X. Helpless against the technology as his telepathic powers don't work on them, Ultron has him crushed and killed. Killed. The story ends with Danger and Ultron soaring off to bring havoc to the universe, flying through space on their creepy, mishmashed sentinel child. It's like a scary story, but it's also a romance story at the same time. Number two, what if Wolverine was never deprogrammed? This is a pretty scary and gruesome one, I'm not gonna lie. Though, you know, still keeping in line with the PG-13 aspect of comics, a lot of the gore is hidden, but you can still imagine it. And when you imagine what's happening to these people, here is pretty insane. 
Here we get to imagine what if Wolverine just kept on being a killing machine, brainwashed into taking out his fellow heroes, including all of those that he loved. As in many of these potential scenarios, it comes down to Wolverine and Kitty Pride. Kitty is unable to fathom how Wolverine could be so far gone that he'd kill her, and yet after witnessing the death of everyone at his hands, including Invisible Woman who is clawed through the bottom of her feet before getting claws right through her face, and Captain America who gets claws right up through the bottom of his jaw through his entire head, she is forced to confront the reality that her mentor and friend Logan is really gone. Like, that's definitely gonna convince you once you see that. You're like, um, okay, there's no hope for you. In the end, she sacrifices her hand, and it's implied her life in killing Wolverine. She phases her hand through his head, turning it solid, and then letting go as Wolverine instinctively slices off her arm, preventing his body from being unable to heal due to the hand lodged in his brain. That'll definitely prevent someone from healing. I don't even wanna think about how you try to do that. How do you function with a hand in your brain? I ask you. Number one, what if Spider-Man had rejected the spider? This is a pretty creepy, crawly, scary one. It begins with Peter Cocoon but refusing to take the spider's path home. Instead he kills the giant spider that confronts him while in metamorphosis, remaining lost and unable to move forward, only half a being. Until Venom escapes Matt Gargan and prison in order to rejoin with Peter Parker, aware that he is stuck in this state mode and vulnerable. Venom bonds with the cocoon and after months of battling with Peter inside is eventually reborn as a new being who goes by the name Poison. Half Peter, half Venom symbiote, permanently bonded. Poison confronts Mary Jane at the Avengers Mansion, but after horrifically attacking her, Aunt May, Wolverine, and Luke Cage, and being spurned by her, disappears, resurrecting his first love, Gwen Stacy, and likely planning to turn her into his monstrous bride. Also there's a weird thing that happens in that story where that poison basically pierces Luke Cage's skin and then he's like haha even I can pierce your stone skin because I'm sharp enough and I was like Wait, what just happened? Doesn't really make a lot of sense. But other than that, it's all pretty good, I think. Number 10, what if the X-Men had lost Inferno? This very chaotic and fire-filled demon horde infested story comes to us from What If Volume 2, issue number six. And we are starting it off hot, friends. This is quite a dark story. Here we get to imagine what the fate of the world would have been like had the X-Men failed in defeating Madeline Pryor during the events of Inferno. Instead, she and Sim take over the planet Earth unleashing hordes of demons on it and ruling it together. However, the heroes who have survived their reign of terror manage to band together and using their power fight back. In the end, they do win the day, but not without casualties. Wolverine himself in the story ends up becoming the pet of the Goblin Queen and Sim, fully giving in to his feral rage and feeding on the innocent. Ooh. He only becomes free from the fog of his rage after he kills Kitty Pride tragically and realizes the monster that he has become. Number 9. What if Captain America were revived today? 1983. Because there's another one of these from like, I think 1994, so yeah, but that's in volume two. We're going to volume one. There are actually a few different stories involving Captain America being revived in the modern day or simply evolving with time as it passed. So 1994, and I think there's also another one of them, which might even be on this list. But in this what if from volume one, issue 44, we get a darker take on what a modern day Cap could look like in the 80s. This version of the hero ends up turning America into a heavily monitored and policed country during his witch hunt for communists. Fortunately, as dark as that all is, we learn that this isn't the real Captain America, but an imposter that took his place after he went MIA. The real Cap returns and battles it out with imposter Cap, but in the end, the real Captain America turns to the people of America to undo all the damage done. He asks them to take responsibility as while they were led to this point by a false version of him, they also allowed themselves to be led falsely. It's honestly a really good speech that even today rings true in a lot of ways, at least for me, and it provides the silver lining and shining hope for an otherwise pretty dark tale. Little grains of hope, that's all we need. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, if you want more what if lists, be sure to let us know by giving this a thumbs up, sharing it, doing all the things. Also, if you want more what if content, we do have a playlist now for that. Yay! Number eight, what if Wolverine killed the Hulk? In issue 31 of the 1977 What If series, we find out what would happen if instead when Wolverine first met the Hulk, he had 
killed him. Wolverine goes on to celebrate his victory against the big green goliath after killing him, having some drinks and throwing some punches like he usually does at the local tavern. However, in the end, things get out of hand and he accidentally kills one of the patrons in a rage. When he seeks help from the military to protect and defend him, they actually turn their back on Wolverine and so he ends up joining the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. He becomes a sleeper agent for Magneto, infiltrating the X-Men. However, when Magneto finally plans on enacting his plan to defeat and capture the X-Men, Wolverine has a change of heart, feeling as though he has truly found acceptance and a family with the mutant team of heroes. He battles Magneto one on one and the two kill one another in the end. It's a pretty tragic tale. Basically all what ifs with Wolverine I feel like are usually pretty sad. <laughs> Pretty sad or pretty dark. Number seven, what if Captain America had not vanished during World War II? See, another Captain America story because I love these. This story comes to us from issue 5 of volume 1 aka the 1977 What If series. While Captain America does not get trapped in the ice and Bucky never goes missing, presumed dead, only to become brainwashed and repurposed by the Soviet Union as the Winter Soldier, a worse fate seemingly awaits both of these heroes. Neither having ever disappeared, Steve goes on to fight as Captain America until he eventually retires from the mantle, becoming instead the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. But Bucky ends up taking his place, becoming the new Cap, as we have also seen happen in modern comics, and Rick Jones ends up becoming Buck's new sidekick, also going by the mantle of Bucky. Because I guess Rick or Ricky just doesn't have the same zing to it? Sadly though, Cap Bucky ends up dying on a mission and Sharon Carter, Agent 13, who had hoped to settle down with Bucky after his final mission, blames Steve for his death. She actually accuses him of robbing him of his childhood and putting him in danger. Pretty intense. And then of course it ends with Rick volunteering to become the new Cap, so the deadly cycle it seems is destined to still continue in this timeline. You'd feel like after that all happened, Steve might be like, maybe we won't do that again. It didn't go great the last time. But he's just like, ah, yes, Rick Jones. Now you will be Captain America and probably die. What if the Green Goblin stole the Infinity Gauntlet? This story comes to us from the What If Infinity Dark Reign one shot. Here we see Green Goblin dealing with a lot of family drama and trauma from his past. He steals the Infinity Gauntlet and not only uses it to defeat, well, all the heroes of planet Earth and beyond, but it's also revealed that his true motivation for doing all of this and pretty much everything that he's done is to win his father's approval. His father, who was always so unimpressed and who for a long time mistreated him, pushing Norman towards greatness or else. When Norman showcases his villainous accomplishments, it only causes his father to revile him even more though. Norman then decides to use his infinity gauntlet to snap and influence his father, making him proud of him instead. But this makes his father's love and approval feel pretty empty. Especially when Norman learns that his altered dad actually really only loves him just because he's his son and not for all that he has accomplished. Which you would think would be really nice, but to Norman he's like, that's infuriating, I hate that. Norman erases his father from existence and in so doing, erases himself. Don't you hate when that happens? Number 5. Marvel Zombies Resurrection While not an exact what if series, Marvel Zombies Resurrection definitely feels like a what if version of the Marvel Zombies world that imagines a completely new scenario involving zombies based on established Marvel lore where Galactus becomes infected with a mysterious new virus that it turns out was created by the brood dun 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 to infect people more efficiently turning them instead into zombies. The whole series from 2020 and the intro to it from 2019 that kind of explains all of the lore that you need to know to jump in is all pretty bleak with only a few people on earth making it out alive in the end and still fighting basically just to survive after the world has pretty much been completely infected after Galactus's corpse is hurled to the earth to be used as a kind of zombie creating bomb. But while the story is pretty dark in terms of all the great heroes that we lose, do not worry. At least Carol's flirk and cat Chewie stays safe. Thank goodness. In case like me you read this and you were worried the whole time about that little fur baby, I was like, no, please don't let Chewie die, Chewie's so cute. Chewie is also a badass, so really there's no need to worry. Chewie's like one of the best 
fighters in this entire series, which I love. Number four, what if Clint Barton killed Norman Osborn during Dark Reign? This what if comes answered in the what if Dark Reign one shot. Here we get to see what could have happened had Clint Barton's plan to kill Norman Osborn actually come together. Clint himself ends up making a martyr out of Osborn though, unfortunately, and becomes a wanted man in the process. One civilian decides to take the matter of justice into his own hands, calling out the assassin, Clint Francis Barton. And if he doesn't show himself, he threatens to blow up the entire Sunday Inn and all the innocent people that are inside it. Hawkeye does show up though and attempts to talk the man down, but surprisingly, the man pulls a gun and shoots Clint point blank to death rather than surrender. He is taken away and in the end, Hammer remains in control under deputy director, likely now full director actually, Victoria Hand. Basically, if Hawkeye had actually killed Norman Osborn, it would be bad, I think, in the long run. I think that's what we learned. Number three, what if the Kingdom of Cain? And what if issue 94 out of the 1989 series, also known as volume two, we get to visit a world destroyed by the Sentinels? Oh goody. The Sentinels did not only take out all of mutant kind supposedly, but also killed all of Earth's mightiest heroes besides, and its general population of non-powered individuals who were killed by high levels of radiation that the Sentinels emitted. The only one to survive all this destruction is Juggernaut. Not, who wanders the earth for years reminiscing on his past and all of his wrongdoings, and feeling unbearably lonely all the while. Poor Juggernaut. Magneto shows up and confirms that everything that has come to pass is Juggernaut's fault because he killed Professor X, which was basically the catalyst event for this chain reaction of destruction that has now come to pass. Juggernaut finds and kind of falls into a secret bunker as a result of his fight with Magneto, where he learns that some mutants survived and are actually hiding out. Yay! When they ask him to leave them be though, he refuses, only to learn that this was an attempt to protect themselves against the radiation, which he is now let in by breaking into the bunker, infecting them and ultimately sentencing them to death. So it's really sad. Juggernaut's like, I'm lonely, I just want to like talk to you. And they're just like, you just killed us, so thanks for that. He's like, wow. I ruin everything, this is terrible. <laughs> Number two, What If the Traitor? In this alternate tale that comes to us from the 1989 volume of What If issue negative one, we get to see what would happen if Trevor Fitzroy went back in time to try and convince Professor X to never create the X-Men. Although Bishop travels back in time to try and stop Fitzroy, it doesn't end up working out. Fitzroy shows the professor of the future to come and all the war and prosecution the mutants will suffer. When Professor X meets Bishop, he inquires of Jean's fate and learns that she perishes, but that he and his X-Men remain a symbol of hope for the people. Unable to accept the dark future that awaits, however, Professor X seemingly agrees, despite Bishop's pleas, to never let the X-Men form, and Bishop ends up being locked up in prison in the past, with both Fitzroy and Bishop believing the other is the traitor. But who's really the traitor? Number one, what if Spider-Man back in black? This story reimagines what would have happened had MJ ended up being shot by the Kingpin's hitman instead of Aunt May. Mary Jane as such does not end up in intensive care hanging to life by a thread, but instead dies pretty much instantly. This makes Peter lose control, going into a dark rage unlike any we've ever seen. He doesn't just plan on scaring and potentially finishing the Kingpin if MJ dies, because I mean she's already dead, but instead he plans on just straight up setting out to kill whoever was responsible for the hit, which he of course does find out was still Kingpin in this reality. Donning his black costume, he heads out planning to put an end to Kingpin once and for all, despite Aunt May and Iron Man trying to stop him and calm him down. In the end, Peter succeeds in killing Kingpin, Aunt May basically disowns him, and Iron Man has him arrested for murder, citing the Superhero Registration Act. Peter blames Iron Man for all this mess, by the way, demanding a trial with a jury, and Iron Man denies any wrongdoing, claiming Peter made his choice. Kicking off the list with number 10, What If the Juggernaut. Okay, to start this sad list, we got What If starring the Juggernaut. It was released in 1997, written by George Gonzalez, and we kick off in a world where Sentinels have already wiped out all superheroes. Great start. Plus, there's this toxic gas that's filling up the atmosphere, which will kill all of life. So things are beginning grim right off the bat, okay. And all that's left now at this point is just the Juggernaut. Now he's hunting down these Sentinels. He wants to die, but his own invulnerability won't let that happen. Kind of like Hulk the End, just a sad, strong man in a world full of rubble. So he sees Iron Man's helmet, he sees Cyclops' cracked visor, 
He's just walking down horrible memory lane. Then he meets a couple of surviving mutants and they're not in good condition, mentally, I mean. They're actually blaming Juggernaut for killing the X-Men, and it all ends with Juggernaut knowing he's going to be the last living being on the planet, and that it's his own damn fault. And before we go on to number nine for our next sad what if story, if you guys could go ahead and please like this video, or else we'll be on a what if you didn't like the video, and then it's gonna be a sad video on all the alternate futures where you didn't like our videos. So please go ahead and do that, because that would be great. You guys are the best, thank you so much. Now back to the list. Number nine, what if Cable had destroyed the X-Men? Well, this one just sounds bad right off the hop. So after Professor X came back to Earth, the team was never going to be the same again. At this X-Men meeting, Xavier gets in a fight with Cable, and then all of a sudden it turns into Cable and his crew versus everybody, and it was just this big brawl. Now they escape, but later on, Cable kills Xavier, Jean, and Scott with a siren bomb. So now everybody's deciding on what to do with this guy. Wolverine's team wanted to kill him, and Storm's team wanted to bring him in. Both are pretty bad. So the Avengers have to step in and fight their battles while they're all working their own stuff out over there. So the Avengers are like, just do your thing. We're going to go fight your bad guys. Just wrap it up. But eventually Cable and his team is killed by Wolverine's team. Number eight, what if Wolverine battled Conan the Barbarian? Written by Glenn Hurdling and released in 1990, what if Wolverine had battled Conan the Barbarian? So basically Conan and Wolverine switch dimensions. So we have Wolverine causing trouble in the Hyborian Age alongside Red Sonja and Conan smashes Cyclops in the head with a rock which causes the full fury of the Phoenix Force to be unleashed. So now this has caused a ripple effect, so the psychic rapport was shattered, and without Wolverine to hurl Colossus at her, there's nothing that prevents Jean Grey from transforming into her dark persona before she can destroy herself, resulting in the destruction of the entire universe. So just like that, Cyclops gets hit with a rock and then it all goes to shit. So yeah, crossovers are for sure fun, but you gotta look at the possible ways it could go poorly as well. Wolverine versus Conan the Barbarian is definitely one of those ways. Number seven, what if Professor X had become the Juggernaut? In this reality, Professor X is the one who becomes Juggernaut and gets buried. Now this causes him to go down a completely different path when it comes down to the X-Men, because after this, he never ended up creating the X-Men, because he was stuck. So now the Fantastic Four wants to defeat Magneto instead. So Professor X, he's still listening. He's using his mind powers. He's knowing what's going on out there. He's kind of getting pissed that he's not able to go out and help. So he digs his way out and his telepathy powers are now stronger than ever with his new juggernaut super strength. So he takes over the country with his own X-Men posse to enforce these anti-human laws. So Cyclops even sided with Magneto at this point because he could block Xavier's telepathy. So they're battling it out on Asteroid M and Cyclops is trying to remind Xavier about his original dream, you know, with humans and mutants living together in harmony. And before he could really consider it, the ground beneath him exploded and he got launched into space probably forever. And man, that's gotta be boring. Imagine not dying in space. That sounds like an absolute nightmare. This should be number one, maybe, I don't know. Number six, what if the Hulk died and Kyra lived? Written by Greg Pak, released in 2007. Okay, so we start with the Hulk saving Kyra by throwing her out of the way of the explosion instead of the ship. So now the Hulk had died along with Crown City. And Kyra, she's pretty pissed, right? She takes all the old power from the planet and gets ready with her sights set on Earth. She's coming. First stop, of course, being the moon where she defeats Black Bolt and then implants a obedience disc on him. So when Strange and Sentry come to the rescue, she makes Black Bolt use his sonic scream, which of course results in both of them dying. She's killing everybody fast, okay? So Heroim comes to stop her and says that basically if you kill everybody on Earth, nobody can honor your dead husband. So she says, fine, but you're gonna wish you were dead instead. And then it cuts to 21 years later and she's made all the remaining heroes build this massive Hulk statue. And when it's finally done, she walks onto the hand of the statue and then turns it to stone, joining him. The end. Yeah, how sad is that? I mean, I feel like it wouldn't take those guys 21 years to build a statue. I mean, if they're getting paid by the hour, sure, then by all means, go for it. Number five, what if the Avengers had never been? Written by Jim Shooter and Gil Kane, released in 1977, this was actually the first what if issue with a major death. So of course it has to be on the list somewhere. So we start off with the Hulk. Now this time he's not hitting, he's actually quitting. Now this caused the Avengers to dismantle. So Stark asked Rick Jones to find the Hulk, Thor went back to Asgard and Jan and Hank went back to living as normal people. So Rick finds him, but he's now being held hostage from the Green Giant. So Stark swoops in and saves him and they head back to the Avengers mansion. So Namor and the Hulk call out the Avengers, or rather what's left of them. So Iron Man makes a few iron suits for the others and the suits, I mean, 
They aren't Tony Stark. They can't control these things nearly as well as he can. Unless you're in the movie Iron Man 3, then everyone can do that all of a sudden. So they stay in retirement. They're like, screw that. I don't want any part of that. So he's like, whatever. He powers up his own suit a little bit too much, and then he heads to the battle alone. He fights a bit, and then right when he's about to be ended, the rest show up. Jan, Hank, and Rick are back. Nice. So Tony is done at this point. His armor is weak. He's close to being finished off. So he uses his remaining power to regenerate Hank's armor. So the Hulk snaps out of it and goes after Namor while the rest of our heroes mourn over a fallen Tony Stark who sacrificed himself to save his team. Similar vibes to Endgame. A lot of feels in that one, okay? A lot of feels. A good number five feels train. Number four, what if somebody else besides Spider-Man had been bitten by the radioactive spider? Written by Don Glutt, released in 1977, we get to see a dream play out. Look, we've all probably wanted to be Spider-Man at one point or another. Of course, I mean, doing backflips and swinging downtown, that's gotta be the vibe. But of course, when it comes to stopping criminals and taking out supervillains, it's probably pretty stressful. So in this what if, we get to see this idea play out. We see other characters have a crack at the life of the web slinger starting with Flash Thompson. And let's just say it's a lot harder than it looks. So we got Flash Thompson. Now after he gets bit, he teaches a bad driver a lesson and he feels pretty good with his new given abilities and he plays it out a bit. So he decides to take a crack at professional wrestling, maybe make some cash, which is a pretty good idea. I mean, you're a superhero, so you can definitely win most, if not all fights. But he accidentally kills the guy. Sorry, oops. Then Betty Brant is now up with the powers. Okay, so let's see how she would do in the life. Well, her costume for starters is pretty badass. But when she runs out of web fluid while making TikToks, a thief runs by and gets away. And that thief, of course, being the one to take Uncle Ben's life. So far, so bad. Now, finally, we have our third contender with the powers. John Jameson. While his outfit was also pretty good, he couldn't do the job like Peter. And he actually died while trying to prevent a space shuttle from crashing. I guess it's not as easy as it looks. I mean, to be fair, if something actually happened and I had webs, I really wouldn't know what to do. I would do a backflip and be like, is it fixed? No? It was cool though. Number three. What if the Punisher killed Daredevil? We all know the Punisher as the guy who usually brutally kills criminals. See, with superheroes, those guys he likes to hit with a tranquilizer. But in this what if, we see Daredevil get hit with one of those trank darts and fall off a building. So while Kingpin prepared for his next step now that he's out of the way, Spider-Man stepped in to deliver some justice on Frank Castle. So he finds the Punisher and Punisher has no trank darts left. So he shoots Spider-Man in the shoulder. It's messy, but not fatal, he says. He should survive unless he exerts himself, which he does. And his identity is then revealed. Then it cuts to Aunt May's house and she grabs a paper, reads the shocking headline, and then the house explodes from a missile launched from the Silver Main City. Boom, house gone. And then after a little while, Peter shows up in a hospital gown, ready to get some revenge on Frank. Peter does pretty well in the fight. So well, he's actually just moments away from throwing the Punisher off of a building to his death. But the Punisher stalls and says he has info about his Aunt May. And this slows Peter down for just a split second, allowing for the Punisher to unload on Peter. God, imagine if they introduced Frank Castle in the MCU and then they immediately did something like this. Number two, what if Kraven the Hunter had killed Spider-Man? Released in 1990, written by Richard Howell. Yeah, judging by this title alone, this one's a little sad. I figured we're already on the Spider-Man misfortune train, so I had to throw this one in next, you know? What if Kraven had killed Spider-Man? Okay, so we start with Pete patrolling the streets when he's suddenly trapped by Kraven in a net. And just like that, he unloads, killing Peter Parker. And of course, he eats a bunch of spiders and suits up himself to celebrate. Yeah, you eat a bunch of spiders, now you're Spider-Man. That's how it works. I think a human eats like, what, seven spiders in a year when they're sleeping? So we have like, what, 7,000 to go? So now he's Spider-Man, just like that, cool. Meanwhile, MJ is like, where on earth is that Peter Parker guy? Hmm. And then MJ is approached by a couple of thugs and then in comes Spider-Man to save her. Only it's Craven, but she doesn't know that. But she can tell something's up because Spider-Man doesn't recognize her and he's way more brutal with taking out these thugs. So Cap, Daredevil, and Human Torch jump in to see what's up with the wall crawler. They did a decent job of wearing down the beast, but he needed more power. He ate a bunch of spiders earlier, so now it's only fair if he tries to eat Spider-Man's dead body, right? <sighs> Comics are weird. So MJ tells Cap and the gang that Spider-Man is actually Peter Parker and that the Spider-Man is indeed not the same. And then Aunt May goes into denial hearing about the news. She's messed up now for life. And the media isn't happy with the tension between supers and the public. The story ends with MJ standing at Peter's funeral, wondering how things could have been. God, Peter just can't catch a break, eh? Oh my God. And finally, number one, the saddest of them all, what if Wolverine 
father. Written by Rob Williams, released in 2011, we start off with Wolverine taking out the Winter Soldier. And we see a world with Wolverine and Dokken if they had spent their life growing together as father and son. So now we get to see what it would have been like if Logan was there for them the whole time. Now in this reality, they're named John. This life, however, was filled with repression and lies and led to John leaving his home and rising up as Dokken becoming the leader of the Japanese underworld. So Wolverine tried to save him, but because of the way he was raised with this version of Logan, he looked at him like a monster. He viewed himself as a monster too. This is the Muramasa blade, John, says Logan as he stabs him. Healing factors don't work on it. The issue ends with the boy dying beside his father and Logan uses the same blade on himself. And that's the end. That's the end of the comic. Everyone dies, everyone's sad. That's what ifs for you, right there.